welcome everyone. Um, welcome to the Broad Globalization and International Affairs Chase Speaker Talk. I am very pleased that we are actually hosting this talk in collaboration with NYU's um, Hagop Kevorkian Center. Um, so a big thank you to Mohamed Bazi, who is the director there, um, and NYU is my um, is my alumni institution. I went to college at NYU. Um, and who am I? I am Elmira Bayrasli. I am the director of BGIA. Um, because we have um, so many new um, people who are coming to this event, um, I, I just want to say a little bit about BGIA um, because I think a lot of people who are joining us are not familiar with it. We are a semester away program that is based in, in wonderful New York City. And given our name, we're focused on international affairs. And we've been doing that for the past 20 years, since 2001. We have been doing it in a very unique way um, through firsthand experiences. BGIA was created to give students an opportunity to work at organizations focused on a range of global issues. And that includes human rights, justice and law, business and economics, media, civil liberties, think tanks, and multicultural institutions such as the UN. And we're actually taking applications for the spring semester, and you can learn more on bgaa.r.edu, and I will type that into the chat in a moment. I also wanted to give a plug to our brand new MA program that launched this year, BGIA, and this is really exciting. BGIA now has a one-year master's in global international studies. Students spend the first fall semester in Vienna at Central European University, and we have a cohort there right now. They then move to New York where they'll take classes at BGIA and enroll in an internship. And the culmination is a project that will be presented in June. And you can learn more about that program on bart.edu um, backslash MA slash global slash studies. And I'm gonna put that in the chat too because you probably couldn't follow all of that. I know I wouldn't be able to, um, but let's get to the main program. Uh, this is the Chase Speaker Series named after James Chase. James Chase um, is a co-founder of the BGIA program, started in 2001. He was also a managing editor of Foreign Affairs and a leading foreign policy thinker and historian. He taught at Bard College. And the idea behind these lectures is to continue James Chase's commitment to engagement in, internet, in international affairs through dynamic conversation and discourse. And tonight that discourse takes a look at a major event that took place 20 years ago this month, the US invasion of Afghanistan. That is when Pr President George W. Bush um, went into the country in an effort to capture and defeat Al Qaeda and its leaders and its leader Osama bin Laden. And I think as everybody joining us here knows, um, 20 years later, the current US President Joe Biden ended this quote unquote, forever war this past summer, noting that Washington achieved its goal of capturing bin Laden. Um, but as we all saw, the withdrawal from Afghanistan was chaotic as thousands of Afghans scrambled to leave the country. Um, was that withdrawal the right decision? And did the US achieve its goals in Afghanistan? Um, to answer these questions, we are joined by, I, I'm proud to say two friends of mine um, former U.S. State Department official Annie Forsheimer and Bard, Bard College diplomat in residence and Professor Fred Hoff. Annie is a non-resident associate with the Center for Strategic and International Studies. She is currently an adjunct professor at the City University of New York and a commentator and advocate on foreign policy matters. Um, she retired from the State Department with the rank of Minister Counselor and she was the Acting Deputy Assistant Secretary of State for Afghanistan until March 2019. And from 2017 to 2018 was the Deputy Chief of Mission in Kabul. And Fred Hoff is also an alumnus from the State Department. Before joining BARD, uh, Fred was the outgoing director of the Atlantic Council's Rafiq Hariri Center for the Middle East. He served as ambassador and special advisor for the transition in Syria under President Obama and as Special Coordinator for Regional Affairs in the U.S. Department of State's Office of the Special Envoy for Middle East Peace, where he advised Special Envoy George Mitchell 
on a range of Arab-Israeli issues. Um, again, I just want to reiterate that we are co-sponsoring this event with NYU's Hagop Kevorkian Center, um, and you can expect more collaborations between BGIA and the Kevorkian Center, and I'm really looking forward to doing that. Um, and now I, this is where I'm going to bow out, but before I do that, I want to go through show flow. Fred, I'm going to hand the mic over to Fred in a minute, and Fred and Annie are going to talk for about 30 minutes, and then they're going to open it up to Q&A. When we do have a Q&A, you can raise, use the raise hand icon to ask a question, or you can type it in the chat box. We'll try to get to all the questions. We do have um, a large number of participants with us this evening. Um, so I, I don't wanna give any promises that we'll get to all of them. Um, and please ask a question, don't make a speech. Um, and with that, um, welcome Annie and Fred. And Fred, I hand, I hand the mic over to you. Well, thank you, thank you, Elmira, and thank you so much for inviting me to uh, to be part of this. I do try to teach, among other things, diplomacy um, at Bard, and it's always a thrill for me uh, to be able to uh, expose my students to uh, uh, real, really successful professional diplomats like uh, like Annie. So, uh, so thank you for the invitation. This is uh, this is wonderful. Annie, let's let's start indeed by talking about uh, you know life as a diplomat. You were you are a retired career diplomat. You spent uh, uh, a great deal of your thirty years at state function, uh, working on functional issues like uh, security, rule of law, human rights. I uh, I actually read your bio. I note that you spent a lot of time in uh, uh, working on uh, Latin America, and I understand you even did a tour of duty in Kabul uh, before you became uh, Deputy Chief of Mission. Um, I think my, my bar diplomacy students and others listening uh, uh, to our conversation would really like to have a sense of how your long and winding road as a career diplomat uh, took you to Kabul, Afghanistan in 2017 as the Deputy Chief of Mission. How, how does that work in terms of a career? Thank you so much. Thank you, Elmira, and thank you, uh, Fred, for the, for the introduction. Um, the long and windy road, uh, every diplomat can, <laughs> I know it's another way of saying old, isn't it? But every diplomat can design their own career and uh, I decided at some point early on that one thing I wanted to do was to go to any place where I really thought that I could learn, uh, experience something really different, and, um, and definitely see more of the world. Uh, there can be a diplomatic career track that focuses on one region. Um, and sometimes people who've put in some real time learning particular languages, they stay in a region or even a country, let's say like China. But in my case, I wanted to try a lot of different, uh, you know, options and angles. So I worked in Turkey. I did work in Latin America. I was in South Africa during its democratic transition. And I worked on UN peacekeeping, which gave me a really broad sense of the world, you know, all the crises all at once. And I worked on the functional issues that you mentioned, security, human rights, and I found myself really drawn to Afghanistan uh, in 2007, eight, when it came time to look for my next adventure. And it was a, a place of, that mattered, you know, of purpose. And so taking what I had learned in other parts of the world and my own skills that I was developing as manager, at that point, I was the director for the political section at the embassy. And after that tour, um, I did work in a number of other areas, got more management experience, and was able to compete successfully to become, uh, to become the deputy chief of mission and go back a second time to Afghanistan, a place which I, I cared a lot, I care a lot about, and I had friends and a sense of wanting to continue the work that I had done previously. Well, well, Annie, as you as you reflect back on your first tour in uh, in Afghanistan, back in the uh, I guess in the 9 10 time frame when you were director of the political section, uh, that's about halfway through the twenty year uh, period we're looking at here. And as you reflect back on on those days, did did you have did you have the sense 
that uh, that Afghanistan was changing for the better, that the United States had a reasonable game plan. Uh, as you as you as you think about it now, going back going back a decade, uh, how did things look then? In two thousand and nine, uh, it felt extremely unfinished. Uh, the game plan, the the progress to date. I think the U.S. was at the the inflection point then of looking at this as it had been as sort of a traditional war, if such a thing could be traditional. Um, the military was very, uh, very much in the driver's seat on policy issues. They were really ascendant in Washington and in the embassy. It was a bit difficult for those of us in the civilian service to, um, you know, to put in a word of maybe caution or nuance uh, you know, I always say that the military would say to us, well, we say, yes, sir, but the State Department says, yes, but, you know, and, and they didn't appreciate it. Uh, we were seen as not being positive or optimistic enough. You know, optimism is an interesting thing. As an observer, you can see it, perhaps, but if you're a participant, being optimistic is a bit of a choice. You have to say, if I work hard enough, this slightly impossible thing I'm doing might just be possible. And so the can-do attitude really pervaded some of the policy choices of the moment. Um, if you were looking at it with a little bit more cynicism, perhaps you would have made a bunch of different decisions, but that was where the military's mind was. In 2009, there was a major policy and strategy review by the new president. Uh, and at that point, there was a question of whether or not there should be a surge in troops. Um, the ambassador, and I was part of this process, the ambassador wrote a cable to Washington saying, more troops right now is not the answer. We don't have a reliable partner in the Afghan government. And essentially, the moment there would have been to say, you know what, this is really not a war we can win militarily, but we need to set aside a long time to see a process through to its end. So that really, it really was an inflection, an important inflection point, I take it then, 09, 09, 09 and 10. It was. Um, the troop surge happened. And unfortunately, I think the president, President Obama, made the worst of all the choices he could have. He did give the troop surge a chance, but then he immediately stated when they would be leaving. Right. Right. So I think he really emboldened the Taliban at that point. Uh, the troop surge didn't really change any of the facts on the ground. Well, as uh, as head of the political section, you obviously uh, you know learned learned a lot about Afghanistan. If you fast forward six or seven years, and all of a sudden you're you're getting the word that you're going to be posted there again, this time as uh, as deputy chief of mission. Uh, what did you think? What did you think you actually knew going in, and uh, and and how much did you have to unlearn? Well, very important to to not imagine that you know too much. That's right. Um, you know, I did uh, the usual set of consultations among U.S. agencies. Uh, obviously, the Pentagon, the State Department, and uh, U.S. Agency for International Development, uh, with some uh, people in Congress and with Afghans um, and speaking, I had the opportunity to make some good friends when I was there my first tour so I could speak to those Afghans and get a sense from them about where things have been going. But the biggest difference between my first and second tours was um, in 2015, there was a bilateral security agreement signed between the US and Afghanistan, which essentially flipped the responsibility, the sort of leading fighting responsibility, which had been with the United States uh, Army military as the Afghan military was really, really nascent. In 2015, the US stepped back from such an active operational role. And so when I returned, I was no longer returning to an embassy where it was so heavily dominated by military decision makers. I'm, I'm curious too. I, I mean, in, in my experience, the uh, the, the position of uh, deputy chief of mission in an embassy is a uh, is obviously it's it's extraordinarily important in many respects. Uh, the deputy chief of mission is the chief operating officer in the embassy, someone who's uh, responsible for making the train run on time, 
Um, I, I understand that uh, in Afghanistan, by the time you got there to take this position, there had been a, been a change made, something, I guess, perhaps unique to Afghanistan. What, and, and how did that work? Yeah, Afghanistan, uh, what's called the front office is usually the ambassador and the deputy chief of mission. And they, they are in a way alter egos, but you're right, the deputy chief of mission or DCM is more likely to be the person who focuses on the sort of internal running of the embassy. Uh, in some countries, there are a lot of issues that arise with embassy housing and families and problems of that nature. Uh, in Afghanistan, it was a really different arrangement. And first and foremost, no families, none of the usual issues that might beset a, a, a senior manager. But the front office of the Afghanistan, of the Kabul embassy had three people. You have the ambassador, the deputy chief of mission, and a function that only exists in Afghanistan or existed, the assistant chief of mission. And that person specifically was the lead on the administrative and security issues, which were really, really a little overwhelming. Um, now, three people, uh, we didn't usually have three people at a time. Uh, the other sort of special function in Afghanistan is that when you take a R&R &R, a vacation, you take a slightly longer one than usual. And so we often would be covering for each other. So out of the three of us, there were always two. Um, but I spent a lot of time being the, the charge, the person in charge of the embassy, uh, or backing up my ambassador in the external functions of an ambassador, meeting with the host government, uh, or can, you know, representing the United States with other countries. Well, and I, I was wondering, what did this, uh, what did this arrangement do for your ability uh, to get outside of the building, uh, to, you know, to, to get out uh, into the streets and even, uh, you know, out beyond Kabul? Well, in my first tour, I had a couple of opportunities to travel. In the second tour, it was much more difficult. And in fact, to travel, I would be for, for me who at least seen some of the country was taking opportunities from other people. So I stayed back a bit, but at least I was able to get out of the embassy compound. Good. It's a pretty large compound, but many people didn't really leave it in between their you know, trip to the airport to, to go home again. Um, I could go out for meetings and I did almost every day and met with, you know, with Afghans in general, um, with UN officials, uh, and others. I had a lot of security. Um, you know, there was there were a lot of rules, and I even had a security officer who would follow me uh, sometimes when I was on the compound. And uh, one day I was going to our um, information center because one of the things I could do, and this is three, four years ago before Zoom, but we had a video conferencing center, and we had something called Lincoln Learning Centers. Uh, the U.S. had sponsored these library or library corners throughout Afghanistan in every one of 34 provinces. And young people were coming even from really rural areas to learn English and, and just have this learning opportunity. And they liked to have speakers. So I would speak to a couple of these groups of young people at a time and talk about diplomacy or America or whatever they wanted. And I found my security guard following me. And I said, well, why are you here? We're just inside the embassy. He said, well, you're going to speak to a crowd of young people. I said, oh, yes, <laughs> on the screen. <laughs> I'm fine. Yeah. Thank you. <laughs> well, I, I certainly hope that the, uh, that the students following this conversation, especially, especially those who are considering uh, foreign service careers, uh, are, uh, are deriving something, something from this, what it's, what it's really like to serve as a foreign service officer. Let's segue now to, to Afghanistan itself, Annie. Uh, a, a lot, an overwhelming amount of the news reporting and commentary, even starting months before the uh, August 31st US military withdrawal uh, from Afghanistan has focused on the successes and failures of American actions in uh, executing the withdrawal in evacuating American citizens and others. Uh, it's, actually, it's actually not all about us, uh, but you'd probably never know that uh, following the, uh, 
the, the news commentary. Uh, what about the center of gravity in all of this, uh, namely Afghanistan? And in what, in what ways, from your point of view, does, does the Afghanistan of 2021 differ significantly from the Afghanistan of 2001 when we first went in militarily? Well, it differs, I'm happy to say, in a couple of tangible uh, areas of health and infrastructure. You know, this is a country where people are living longer, that maternal mortality is down by two thirds. It's actually the birth rate is much lower. Uh, electricity has come to the, came to majority of the country and, and water and the ability to, um, you know, to access health care. Uh, those were all, you know, slow to put together, but um, slow and steadily put together by a real host of international institutions uh, with, with a great deal of help from the United States. And um, the young people of today who have never lived under the Taliban have grown somewhat used to, um, you know, especially those in the urban areas standards of life that that I think they're going to want to keep. Um, you know, are they absolutely, um, you know, were they well served by their government in every way? No, they were not. Um, and I don't know that we can say that they grew used to democracy since democracy is entirely individual to a country. And so Afghanistan's own version of self governance is still a work in progress. It's still an extraordinarily difficult place to run um, you know, its topography, its history, its division of ethnic groups, even division of languages, sure. and, and the fact that so many people have been internally displaced. And at this point, probably the cynicism they feel about anybody who offers them, you know, yet another brand new way of life. You know, it's very, very difficult to run. So I think the 2021 sees an Afghanistan that is, you know, it was healthier and more accustomed to certain modern conveniences and definitely more connected to the world. I mean, there's, no, yeah. there's no comparison between the 2001 Afghanistan where you know, there were barely landlines and the eight, nine million cell phones that exist today and television penetration, the world has come to Afghanistan and they, they, are, they are interested in keeping it there. Well, and you mentioned you mentioned the Taliban, and what, what you described raises, I, I guess, a, a you know a pretty obvious question. Uh, even before 2001, uh, the Taliban was not necessarily known uh, for the quality of its governance, uh, even in, in an Afghanistan that lacked that lacked a lot of the uh, you know electricity and and, and so forth. Uh, here we are in 2021. Does to the best of your knowledge. Does the Taliban possess any, any core competencies for governance? Does it possess anything you know, beyond uh, an ability to uh, conduct a violent uh, insurgency? I think, unfortunately, the evidence of how they were running the parts of the country that they controlled up until you know, this, this summer uh, suggests that no, they really haven't gained any kind of competency in governing when it comes to provision of services. In those parts of the country, the government or the international community was still providing the services. They were simply a sort of uh, you know, overhang of providing security slash justice, which could be brutal and sometimes very effective. But that's completely different than being able to manage money, to be able to tax or to appeal to international donors to get money that you then turn into services that you deliver you know, with equity and transparency. And believe me, the Afghan government was having its difficulties with that. But they were at least uh, fundamentally in favor of it. And they were also, um, you know, the Afghan government was filled with people from the bottom up who were learning, um, you know, who were university educated, which was really a brand new generation for, uh, for Afghanistan, but also really interested in the well-being of their country's institutions. 
the Taliban, I think, have served as, in a sort of parasite role uh, for those services like clinics and schools. I, at this moment in time, it doesn't look like they have any competency in figuring out how to deliver that. So is this a matter of the uh, of the Taliban uh, having to get really smart in a big hurry, or or does it does it really have to reach out and uh, and broaden its own governance base in order to uh, in order to do a credible job of uh, delivering services and being seen as uh, competent? Yes, unfortunately, there's a third choice there, right, which is that they can rule a broken country. Yeah. Uh, you know, the, if you assume that what they want is to be competent and to um, improve the living standards of Afghan citizens, then yes, they either have to learn how to do it themselves or they have to reach out effectively to international experts. But I, I think there is that other option, which is that they don't want uh, to do those things if it comes at the expense of their control. Yeah, uh, And this is, of course, controlled not only over Afghan citizens, but their own movement. If they move too far towards the international community, it's possible that more radical members of the Taliban will, will desert them, will join the Islamic State, for example. So the Taliban leadership, uh, they have a series of choices, and right now they seem to be pulling more towards the hard line. Okay. Well, Annie, as you you know, as you think of the uh, the Afghans you've gotten to know over the years, uh, I'm sure that some of them are out of the country by now. Uh, others are not out of the country, and 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 for those who are in and who are not likely to leave anytime soon, uh, particularly women who have uh, experienced certain aspects of liberalization over the past twenty years. What are, what are their what are their prospects now? Um, dark at the moment, not not at all. Uh, you know, I it, it's you know I'm here in comfort and we're all comfortable. Let's say in the United States, I think it would be unimaginable uh, to consider what they have to contend with because in addition to all of the sort of social and political losses that, let's say, a, a girl of 15 who was going to high school who thought maybe about a career, at this point, she will no longer be in school. She may be at 15 being told that she's going to get married and she has no choice in who that is. Uh, and add to that that the funding of basic human services has been essentially cut off. You know, Afghanistan is going to switch over to being a country that can only receive humanitarian aid. That's where you start thinking about bags of food, rather than having a functioning economy where people draw a salary and, you know, shops are in business and a private sector is growing. Um, they are regressing economically as we speak. It's getting, you know, winter is coming. They have been suffering from COVID. I, I'm sorry this sounds so dire, but it is dire. And then you have sort of the host of fear of violence that probably, you know, in our hierarchy of needs, that's the first thing people are worried about. Is there retribution against people who served with the previous government? Or let's give you one example, a woman uh, who was a social worker for a women's shelter, okay? And the Taliban let everybody out of jail, which includes, the aggrieved husband of somebody who had been at the shelter, and he comes looking for the social worker. So, on small ways and big ways, you know, the 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 fear of violence is there, and the fear of, I'm afraid, you know, starvation is also something that is beginning to bite. Well, clearly, the uh, the near term uh, the near term prospects uh, for Afghanistan are uh, daunting, uh, to say the least. Um, we've been uh, we've been talking about the past twenty years. If uh, if you were to engage in uh, some some very educated speculation, um, what's let's put it this way: what's what's the best case you could see you could foresee for Afghanistan twenty years from now, and what what basically would have to happen 
for that best case to begin to take shape? The best case in 20 years, uh, I have a, a young friend, she is under 30 and is just astonishingly smart and confident. So I told her that I think in 20 years, she'll be president of Afghanistan. That's what I want to believe, and it helps her. <laughs> uh, she's a refugee right now. Uh, but it's possible. You know, there's an amazing generation that's between the ages of 20 and 30 that had a little bit of a chance at a peaceful stage to, um, to become educated and to start working on big projects that really matter. And um, if the Taliban is unable to govern, you know, the worst case, as we all know, is some kind of fractured civil war. But a better case is a transitional period where the Taliban agrees to rule alongside others. And over time, the vast majority of Afghans who do not want to return to some kind of, you know, extraordinarily uh, strict interpretation of Sharia and tribal customs, which is what the Taliban want to reintroduce, that group of people can yeah. slowly but surely pressure their way into greater liberalization. Well, Annie, uh, I am gonna need to yield to uh, Elmira here. I'm sure there are some, uh, some interesting questions bubbling out there, but I, but I did wanna give you an opportunity to comment on the, uh, on the, on the manner of the, uh, the US withdrawal uh, from Afghanistan on the, uh, on the violence that, uh, that accompanied it and, uh, and have your sense about what, what should the United States be doing, if anything, about Afghanistan now? Well, I'll start with that second question. What we should be doing is remaining engaged. Uh, the idea that the U.S might want to, you know, say, turn the page or walk away, or, you know, I'm old enough to kind of understand what happened after Vietnam in terms of people feeling bad about themselves, so they don't want to think about this place. I, that to me just simply is not or should never be an option. We have a moral obligation and we have a strategic obligation to care about what happens in Afghanistan and to try to make it a more stable part of the world because instability in that in that region matters to us. I think we know, you know, the 9-11 example, but we should also think about the fact that Afghanistan borders Iran and China and Pakistan and the southern, you know, sort of rim of Russia with the Central Asia states. There are huge energy reserves in that region and of course mineral reserves and a lot of people who deserve a far better chance than they are getting. Um, what do I think about the withdrawal? I'm pretty sure you can tell. Uh, I think that the decision was uh, the wrong one and it was badly executed. And uh, I don't think there's any excuse for it. There's no reason for it. Uh, it showed to me a disdain for the lives of the people that we had so deeply impacted. And it's honestly a disservice, you know, first and foremost to the Afghans, but to the veterans and people like me who serve there, I think it's also a grave disservice to us because I, I witnessed three, uh, because <laughs> I managed my tour the last time so that I could be there twice for the ceremony that we held every September 11th at the US Embassy in Kabul, which I found really moving because I felt like we had taken something evil and made something better. And I was very, very patriotic and inspired by that. And I just think that what we have done so far is such a tremendous disservice uh, to, to all of us who feel like our country is capable of much better. Well, Annie, I thank you. I, I, I think this, uh, this kind of brings us uh, full circle and uh, Elmira, I'm happy to turn it over to you for the Q&A session. Sure, no problem. Um, we've already got a couple of questions in the chat. So if you do have a question, you can type it into the chat or you can use the raise hand icon. Uh, I'm gonna call on my student first and I believe he is your student as well, Fred Cameron. Um, and this is gonna be a tough question, I know. 
Um, he asks, um, since the United States was aware of the deadlines for potential military withdrawal, what delayed the issuing of special immigrant visas for Afghan translators and others who aided US forces? How many are left in Afghanistan? And what is the US doing to get those, those who were left behind out of the country? Um, there was a lot of delay in the SIV program. Uh, when I was there, my second tour, I was more aware of it. It had not been as big a feature in my first tour. Some of the delays, I think people are saying, okay, I was unaware of it, came out of the Trump administration's decision uh, to, to underfund or, or to even stop the process. But some of the delays were simply that this was a really badly designed process that had something like 14 people or stops along the way where people had to make decisions. And uh, you know, as a longtime bureaucrat, I can tell you that is a recipe for disaster uh, every stage that was delayed even a little bit turned what should have been a six month process into a two year process. And it was delayed even when I was there. Um, I think that uh, we knew about the military withdrawal. I, I guess I believe that the Biden administration didn't actually think that the, the country would fall as quickly as it did. But um, they didn't think, in other words, that our military withdrawal was the same thing as the day on which all these people needed to leave. But I think it all comes down to whether or not they truly um, found this issue important. And I think we're seeing the results of them not believing that it was important. And to this day, I don't think they think it's important. I don't think they're doing enough uh, to um, get SIVs out of the country. I don't have the exact number, but it's, it is probably more than 10 or 15,000 people who are affected by this. And um, the US really isn't doing, the US government really isn't doing that much. Who, the people who are doing a lot are veterans uh, and a number of other groups, private individuals who are chartering planes and quietly slipping people out of the country. It's a tremendous effort that I've been uh, you know, really privileged to uh, watch, not be part of in the same operational way. Um, but the US government is not doing enough. And I do want to if I if I might if I might just add something and, and perhaps invite Annie to comment. If, you know, for me as a as a non-specialist, uh, Annie, uh, but as a as an army veteran, as a Vietnam veteran, the, the thing that was most egregious in all this, the thing that really got my attention as a bad move was the midnight abandonment of Bagram Air Base on the 1st of July. I mean, was this, was this simply a matter of the, of the military as it does now and then telling the president, hey, Mr. President, you want it bad, you're gonna get it bad? Because, because the, the, message, the message to Afghans in the military and the government elsewhere was you're on your own. You know, the fancy logistical support you've been getting from the United States is now gone. So maybe it's time for you to start making deals with, uh, with the bad guys. Am I, am I way off base on that? No, you're entirely correct. Um, you know, the symbolism of it was enormous within Afghanistan. And exactly that point, the Afghan military saw that as the, the clearest uh, indication that they were on their own and that they would not have the kind of crucial logistical and air power and intelligence backup that we had been providing and that their whole military had been designed to depend upon. And yes, I think at that point, the idea that you need to make a deal if the Taliban comes along and says, I, I can kill you or I can give you a bus ticket home. Um, you know, they decided that perhaps they wanted to live to fight another day. And then just on the, um, on people helping uh, Afghans get out, um, Bard College has been a big part of that. And Bard College has managed oh, yes. to, um, mm -hmm. several hundred Afghan students out. Um, and, and we yes, can- Yes, bravo. Yeah, and we continue to um, support the students who are part of the American University in Afghanistan, but also um, the students at um, the American University in Central Asia. Mm -hmm. um, a former student of mine, Adam, uh, he writes, there was extensive media coverage of US engagement with Pakistan on Afghanistan, 
but very little on the extent to which or whether the United States engaged other neighbors like Tajikistan, Uzbekistan, and Iran. Did this diplomacy just go uncovered by the media, or was this a missed opportunity? I think that there is, well, there's sort of the special case of Iran, which is a, a huge missed opportunity. Um, uh, U.S.-Iran relations are not my specialty, and uh, they are pretty complex. But when it comes to Afghanistan, it's just one of these, you know, areas where we and Iran have shared quite a few of the same goals. Uh, they have been a relatively uh, benign or positive player on Afghanistan. And um, when it, very, you know, the very, very beginning in 2002, there was actually a bit of a thaw in relations and we were able to have some, some talks with, Afga with Iran. I, I think it would have been and still would be a really uh, amazing gesture to somehow find a way to communicate with Iran uh, they, they could be playing a role in hosting refugees, which they have no interest in doing. Um, and they could be pressuring the Taliban, which I think they are starting to do on their own. Uh, with regard to Tajikistan, Uzbekistan, and others, you know, uh, Russia is keeping an extraordinarily tight leash right now. Uh, they are having a series of um, military exercises with Tajikistan in particular, but with other Central Asian states, this is their backyard, this is their, you know, um, arena, and they are not that interested in those countries making special arrangements with the United States. That said, yes, this is an area where we should be extending a lot of diplomacy as well. Uh, again, to help host refugees, Tajikistan has been playing a positive role. I think they took in all the Afghan pilots who flew themselves out of the country so that their weapons wouldn't fall to the Taliban. Um, but, you know, all of them, you know, hundreds of people every day are trying to get into Central Asia and are unable to, you know, that this is something the neighbors need to, to be compassionate about. Annie, is there is there any prospect of any of these neighbors playing a a significant role in uh, you know helping Afghanistan over the next uh, over the next year or two, you know particularly if the United States and the international community is a bit slow off the mark. Um, occasionally, you hear stories about uh, China wishing to extend the uh, the Belt and Road Initiative into Afghanistan. Is there is there anything to this, or or is that is that just nonsense? Well, there, there are neighbors and then there are neighbors. So China is a whole other question. Um, you know, the indications are that China, uh, first of all, has been quietly, you know, in dialogue with the Taliban for a long time. And second of all, they have an interest in having a Uyghur separatists who are in Afghanistan kicked out or otherwise disempowered, which is the choice in front of the Taliban. If the Taliban plays ball on that, then they have this possible very good friend uh, who has cash and many, many fewer conditions than uh, the US and the EU and, and many others would have on that cash. And they have offered Belt and Road Initiative uh, you know, status with, with Afghanistan. Um, so I see that relationship as definitely being a cornerstone of how the Taliban can stay in power. Um, but, you know, having said all of that, I don't think that China has a track record of offering assistance in the amount and sustained time frame right. that we have done and that the, the EU has done and that the Taliban would need. Um, Andrea has a question about Zalmay Khalilazad, who was um, appointed by Donald Trump um, and who Joe Biden kept on as the special envoy to Afghanistan. Um, she has very specific questions, but I think they all touch on kind of, I think there's been some questions about, he is of Afghan descent. So I think there's, I think that, that I think that dimension, um, but then I, I guess there's also um, questions about his ethics and his standing. Um, but I think what I, I'd like to do is kind of bring, bring that question to um, how was he as, as an envoy um, and what was the rationale for the Biden administration keeping him on since he was a Trump appointee? Sure. I mean, Ambassador Khalilzad uh, was born in Afghanistan. He left as a high school student. 
uh, and he became extraordinarily successful. Uh, he was appointed by Republican presidents as the ambassador to Afghanistan, Iraq, and the United Nations. And so he was brought back in 2018 at the point where the Trump administration had determined that there should be some kind of more um, you know, uh, structured engagement between the US and the Taliban. And that was his writ, he was supposed to do this. So on some level, people have blamed him for some aspects of policy that were simply the policy of the moment. Uh, and the president who wanted us to get out as soon as possible, constrained Ambassador Khalilzad's freedom of negotiation. You know, if you're negotiating with the Taliban and the president says, I want our troops out immediately, you've just lost a lot of your, you know, your ability to, uh, to get what you want from this uh, discussion. Um, over time, uh, I think that he was trying to make a, an agreement with the Taliban to the exclusion of the power of the then Afghan government to stand up for itself and to negotiate with the Taliban. But he, you know, and he argued, and it was an argument that the Taliban wouldn't sit down with the Afghan government until the Americans had made this agreement to leave. They did end up leveraging the beginning of talks, which happened in September of 2020. But at that point, our anxiety to get out and the US um, political scene, you know, both Republicans and Democrats as voters were very much in favor of getting out. This really undercut the possibility of a successful negotiation. When President Biden took office, he had the choice to go back on this agreement that had happened under his predecessor. He absolutely has turned over, overturned many other agreements by his predecessor. But he chose to keep this in place. He chose to keep Ambassador Huil's out in place. And he chose to disregard the advice he was given by the congressionally mandated uh, Afghanistan study group of experts that said, you know, you should keep a small number of troops in the country and use those troops to leverage a successful political negotiation. And he disregarded that advice and made his decision. I don't think he felt the need to change Ambassador Khalilzad because he, President Biden, pretty much knew what he wanted to do. And he was trying to use this process started under the previous administration. Uh, honestly, I actually don't know what he was using the process for because we, we didn't need an agreement with anybody to withdraw our troops. We were always able to do that. So the agreement didn't actually get us anything uh, it did make 5,000 Taliban troops be released, prisoners released from jail, and it undercut the previous uh, Afghan government. I think, uh, you know, perhaps it's also worth mentioning that, uh, that uh, you know, Joseph Biden has had certain views about Afghanistan for a long, long, long time as senator, as vice president. And uh, in, the, in the interagency, he was quite often uh, the strongest voice for uh, si simply terminating the uh, the endeavor as quickly as possible. So um, <clears throat> I don't want to I don't want to appear to be overly cynical in all of this, but I but I think the president perhaps saw some political advantage in keeping Mr. Trump's special envoy on active duty, so that uh, if things should in some manner go badly. Uh, the president would still have the option of pointing the finger and saying, "Hey, I'm I'm merely uh, I'm merely implementing uh, decisions that the United States already signed up to," and Zal Khalizad is uh, Exhibit A. Uh, I've got two other questions in the chat, but I see that um, one of our MA students has his hand raised. So Hezbollah, I'm going to invite you to ask your question. Um, hello, everyone. Thank you for giving me time. My name is Hezbollah Shafaq. I'm coming from Afghanistan. I'm from Kabul. Um, I have been graduated from the American University of Central Asia with the U.S. Embassy Scholarship. So the question here was that it, 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 I wanted to ask your opinion on the success or the failure of the Qatar or Doha deal that happened between the United States and Afghanistan. 
as um, I have worked with many LLCs that you mentioned in Kabul Life with American councils, with, with so many other programs with American councils. And seeing myself and hundreds of others being left alone to a terrorist groups has been the most heartbreaking, devastating experience of life. I, I am a big uh, criticizer of, of how the, the U is still with Taliban, whether the, the involvement of the government of Afghanistan, a legitimate government, that the UN installed and, and promoted and supported, and then they just gave up on it to uh, have a deal with a terrorist group that were known to no one. I mean, the deal, it, it brought Taliban from a local terrorist group to an internationally legitimate political movement. It undermined the political power of the Afghan government, whether that was by the releasing of a 5,000 prisoners or whether that was not giving any part on it so how would you um elaborate on on the success or whether do you see the whole negotiation as, as a successful political or foreign policy of, of the united states whether that is in the president trump administration or president biden thank you very much um you know you're absolutely welcome i am you know I, am, I don't think sorry really starts to say it, but I am sorry. I am sorry for what you are experiencing. And I know um, in my heart that uh, this disappointment and heartbreak that you're feeling, um, you know, is echoed by many, many people in um, the U.S. And, and veterans and others who served and care about Afghanistan. Uh, we, we do feel it and we apologize uh, in many, many ways that I can't well express well, but um, you know, the, the negotiation was supposed to be part of a bigger package. It was supposed to be the way that we would have that uh, Afghan roadmap uh, between the government and the Taliban to some kind of sustainable political future. And the phrase at the beginning was, nothing is agreed until everything is agreed. In other words, that Doha agreement to withdraw US forces should not have been standing by itself and executed by itself. It was supposed to wait until there was also an Afghan agreement on this political roadmap. And if both of these agreements happened, then both could go forward. And that's the only way that that negotiation made any sense at all. When they took the two apart, everything else started to fall apart as well. And our commitment to people like you should have been much more sacred than our impatience, our strategic impatience and inability to, you know, to stand it one more minute that we had soldiers in another country. That should not have been what drove us. What should have driven us was our commitments to people like you and honestly our own self-interest, right? In seeing a stable Afghanistan that was pro-American that was growing and that was filled with people who were amazing citizens of the world. Um, I think we made, we as a country made a terrible mistake. We have about three minutes left um, and we have two really interesting questions. I'm gonna pick Jennifer's question because I think we can, we can get to this in three minutes. Um, she asks, what constraints does the discord in our own US domestic domestic politics impose on our Afghan policy? And more generally, in what ways is our domestic politics currently shaping or influencing our Afghan policy? Our domestic politics have taken a, an interesting and different turn because they were overwhelming in the drumbeat for get the troops out. Uh, you know, that's an unnuanced opinion, which didn't mean get them out in the worst way possible, but it definitely was a clear across the ideological divide opinion of the American people. And it was clear it didn't come up much during the 2020 presidential election, but it was there in that respect. Uh, at this point now, I know from talking to a number of congressional offices that there's also sort of an interesting unity of those who care about Afghanistan and want us to do better. They, they come from both parties and they're being pushed a bit by veterans groups human rights groups, uh, you know, again, people who really see this other picture. And I think right now, the important thing is that Congress has to stay engaged 
and make the administration step up to its responsibilities. You know, they, they broke this process. They have to fix it. And what they would rather do is make people not think about Afghanistan. And, you know, they, they dismiss concerns by saying, well, we knew it would be a messy process. If that's unacceptable. So I think that Congress has this important role right now. And it's not going to be that hard, uh, amazingly enough, to rise above politics because there is some unity of purpose uh, on the issue. The Congress should be telling the administration, you have to fix the process with SIVs and evacuees. You have to do more to guarantee basic human rights for those who are left behind. And you have to give us a much better answer on counterterrorism. Don't tell us it's going to be all drones and it's going to be fine. So on those three issues, Congress has to do its job and make the administration give them better answers. Well, on that note, I'm gonna say amen. Congress should do its job. Yes. Um, and um, I want to thank Annie and Fred for a really, really so insightful conversation. Um, obviously this is a topic that we will continue to follow, but um, I really appreciate the generous time that you both gave to us this past hour. Um, and to those tuning in, we will have our next Chase event on November 18th. We're gonna do that in the middle of the day. We're actually gonna make it an interactive event and I will send information about that. We're going to do um, an event with on, on peacemaking. Um, so that will be interactive. Um, but please join me in a virtual round of applause for our, our speakers. And I wish everybody a very good night. Thanks for joining us.